In this video, we're going to extend our discussion of identical particles to multi-electron atoms. We'll start by talking about the periodic table, then we'll review spectroscopic notation, and finally we'll uh, talk about Hund's rules. So, because electrons are fermions, they have spin one-half and are subject to the Pauli exclusion principle. This means that the overall wave function of a system with multiple electrons must be anti-symmetric with respect to exchange of any two electrons. For example, if you apply the uh, exchange operator P to a function which has a spatial component uh, psi of R1 all the way to R capital N and chi, which is a spin component of S1 all the way to S sub N, and we will get, if we exchange Rm and Rn, we will get negative of the same function. So now instead of R1 to Rm, and then Rn and R capital N, you have R1 to Rn, and then Rm and capital R capital N, and the same with the spins. And this negative sign is the property of the fermion. In an atom, uh, that means that if the spatial state of an electron is symmetric with respect to exchange, then the spin state must be anti-symmetric and vice versa. Now, now we'll take a look at see what this implies for multi-electron atoms in the periodic table, but we're, we'll make it a little simpler because we're not going to uh, look at anti-symmetrized wave functions for uh, 20 or 30 electrons. We have a different way of talking about it, which makes it, which simplifies it. In general, uh, you have the lowest energy states filled first, and electrons pre prefer to have their spins aligned when possible. So we'll see how this works out. So here's the periodic table. And we'll start at the very top, the hydrogen atom we've discussed extensively. And that has one electron, and the electron can be either in a spin-up or spin-down state. The next atom is a helium atom, which we talked about a little bit before as well. And that has two electrons. And we will talk about the helium atom as having electrons that are uh, have one electron spin up and the other electron in spin down. That is the ground state. That is, both electrons can be in the lowest spatial state if they have opposite spins. And that means they note the electrons will not be in the same state because the spin state is different. Now, of course, uh, that would be uh, a singlet state. So it would actually be a combination spin state. Uh, but we're not going to dwell with that on that right now. We'll just discuss helium having one electron spin up and one electron spin down in the 1s orbital. And that 1s orbital means n equals 1, l equals 0, and m equals 0. And spin then, for the each of the electrons, one has spin uh, m sub s plus 1 half, and the other one has spin m sub s minus one half. If we now look to lithium, we filled up the 1s state. Now we're going to go to the 2s state. That is the n equals 2, l equals 0, uh, m equals 0. And that will fill up with lithium having three electrons and beryllium having a, a fourth electron in spin up, spin down configuration. So these fill the 2s states. But with n equals 2, you can also have l equals 1, and that is the p state. So uh, when l equals 1, uh, you have a multiplicity of 6. And those 6 are described here with boron all the way through neon. So boron has one spin, one electron in, in uh, the 2p state. And remember, uh, right now they're all degenerate. Then we have a second electron in a 2p state and a third electron in a 2p state. And then we have four, five, and six, and now we've filled up the 2p states. And so both the 2s and the 2p and the 1s are all filled with electrons. You can imagine you have one electron uh, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, or whatever way you want to arrange them. There are three states you can put six electrons in there. 
You can then move to the n equals 3 row. And again, you fill up the 3s state and you fill up the 3p states. And because n equals 2, you can have an l equals, uh, pardon me, n equals 3, you can have l equals 2. But that doesn't fill up here, it fills up in the next row. And in fact, what I said about energy is that the uh, the 4s states are actually lower in energy than these, these 10, which are the 3d states. So the uh, L equals 2 states, the D states, have five, a multiplicity of 5 in M, right? 2L plus 1. And then you have 2 electrons in each state, so you have a multiplicity of 10 total. And so these are the transition metals that are filling up the D states. You fill up the 4S state first, then you fill up the 3D states, then you fill up the 4P states. And now you've closed all the way up to 4S and 4P. But now in the in the fives, you have the possibility of having D states, the 5D, but you still have to fill the 4D four, four states, which are these here. You put the 5F states, the 4D states, the 5P states. And we're, what we're missing here is because N equals 5, you're going to have L equals uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So you can actually have the so-called F states as well. But those fill in even further down. So the four F states up here, when N, uh, L equals uh, F and G states, for the four, N equals four, you have D and F states. And the F states haven't filled up here, but they fill up in the next period. So you fill up the six S, then you fill up the four Fs, then you fill up the five Ds, and then the six Ps, and so on. And you can see that um, the energies of these higher values of L tend to be a little bit higher than the S states of the next period down, or the D states of the next period down. And so this basically gives you the construction of the periodic table. You fill up the one S state, the S states here, you fill up the D states in the middle, and you fill up the F states here, and the P states over here. And that gives you the entire structure of the periodic table. So just by counting and looking at the periodic table, you should be able to tell what kind of configuration uh, and how many electrons are in each of these states. Let's take cobalt, for example. Cobalt has 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 3d7. So you have 7 electrons in the d state. And so you should be able, just by looking at the position of the periodic table, to get a rough idea of what the, um, of what the ground state configuration of electrons is. Now, it's not always exactly right, and that's why we're going to talk about Hund's rules. So before that, I'd like to review spectroscopic notation. If you remember, spectroscopic notation contains all the information about angular momentum of the state in a compact notation for an electron, for an atom. You have the term symbol, which is L, that indicates the value of the total orbital angular momentum summed over all the electrons in the highest occupied state. Then you have the superscript, which denotes the total spin multiplicity. So if you have a total spin S, where you add up all the spins of the electrons that you're interested in, that, that are not paired, uh, that gives you a total spin S. And 2S plus 1 is the multiplicity. And finally, you have J down here, which is the value of the total angular momentum J computed by L plus S according to what's called the LS coupling. So in order to figure out what the spectroscopic state of a multi-electron atom is, uh, there are some rules that give you a really good idea of how to calculate that. 
Um, they're called Hund's rules, and they can be used to figure out the ground state of a multi-electron atom. They can also be used as guidelines to determine the proximate energy level ordering. So what are the rules? The first rule is the term with the maximum multiplicity lies lowest in energy. The second rule, for a given multiplicity, the term with the largest value of L lies lowest in energy. And the third rule, for atoms with less than half filled shell, the level with the lowest value of J lies lowest in energy. So, what these say is that maximum multiplicity, remember the multiplicity in the term symbol is 2s plus 1. So you want to maximize spin, the total spin s. For an equal value of multiplicity, you, the lowest energy will be for the largest value of L, total orbital momentum. And then for the atoms with less than half-filled shells, the level with the lowest value of J is lowest in energy. And otherwise, for more than half-filled shells, you have the higher value, the highest value of J is the lowest in energy. And J, of course, is L plus S. The level with the lowest would be L minus S, absolute value, and the level with the highest value of J would be L plus S. So, Hund's rules assume the so-called LS coupling. That means that you couple, you, you calculate the total angular orbital angular momentum first and the total spin angular momentum or intrinsic angular momentum, and then you mix them, you couple them to get J. This is good for most atoms, but in heavier atoms, uh, you have the so-called JJ coupling, which is preferred. Let's look at how these actually work. For the LS coupling, we take all the values of L for all the atoms in this, that are relevant for the system, and you add them up. And that gives you the total orbital angular momentum. You do the same thing for the spins, S1, S2, all the way to S sub n, and you get the total spin S. And J is obtained by giving L plus S. Now remember, these are vectors, so you add them in the form the proper form of, uh, of vectors, which means there's a lot of possibilities. If you have n of these, you have to add them pairwise. Add one, two, and then the next one, and then the next one, and the next one, as we've showed before. So that you can get a lot of possible states. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. The JJ coupling instead, as you might imagine, for each atom, for each electron, pardon me, you add its value of L and its value of S to get a total angular momentum J1. You do that for J2, you do that all the way up to J sub n. So you get the total angular momentum for each electron. You then take all these values of J and you couple them, you sum them together to get the total value of J. So as you can see, you're going to get slightly different values of J this way in slightly different combinations because you're combining the values of L and S for individual electrons in different ways. Let's see how this plays out and how we can use Hund's rules to calculate the ground state uh, term symbol, the configu electronic configuration uh, of various atoms. Let's start with the iron atom. Iron has Z equals 26, and its orbital configuration is the 6th one over. We talked about cobalt and it's, the iron is just one uh, to the left of that, so it has 6d electrons in the 3d state. You have 1s2, so these, this is completely filled. 2s2, completely filled. 2p6, completely filled. 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then you have an, an unfilled d shell. Now, to simplify this, we don't have to add up uh, all the l's for all the electrons, because closed shells will have orbital angular momentum, total orbital angular momentum of zero, total spin angular momentum of zero, and total J of zero. So if you have a fully filled shell, you can ignore it. But you can't ignore a partially filled shell. So we really only look, need to look at six electrons. Now, 
those Hund's rules, even though there's only six electrons, are rather complicated because you have to figure out what the maximum value of the spin is, then you have to figure out what the lowest value of L could be, and so on. But there's a very simple mnemonic, a graphical mnemonic that I use that allows you to figure this out without thinking too much about how spins add and how angular momentum adds. And I'll show you that, and I urge you to uh, figure out how to use it yourselves. So we start by laying out the unfilled orbital, and maybe there's more than one if you have more than one unfilled orbital. Uh, we'll see an example of that in a little bit. Uh, with the largest value of m sub l, the lowest. So in the 3D state, n is 3, l is 2, and so you have a multiplicity, m sub l, of five states, plus 2, plus 1, 0, minus 1, and minus 2. We start with plus 2 at the bottom. Each of these states can have two electrons. One would spin up and one would spin down. Again, we're ignoring the fact that we have to anti-symmetrize these wave functions. We know how to do that with Slater determinants. We just want a mnemonic for figuring out how these electrons will combine and what the term symbol will be, the spectroscopic symbol will be. So we've got the m sub l's as low, the largest value lowest and the lowest value up on top. Then we fill starting from the bottom to maximize the total spin. And we want to maximize the total spin and the total uh, z component of the spin. So we put them all in spin up first. So we start with the first one. We have six of them to put in. We put in a second one. We put in a third one. We put in a fourth one. And we put in a fifth one. And now the sixth one has to go with spin down. It has to go in like that. And now you have a completely filled uh, orbital here. Now, that is the maximum value of S that we can get with six electrons in the D 3D state. When we're done, we sum the total M sub L's to get the value of L. So we look for the highest value of L. And the highest value of L is where all the M sub L's line up and add up to give you uh, a maximum value. Well, these are the M sub L's. We have plus one, plus, plus two times two, plus one, zero, minus one, and minus two. So if you fill all the way up here, you get zero because they all cancel out. But then you have an extra electron here, and that gives you plus two. So our maximum value of L is plus two. Well, L equals plus two gives me a D orbital, or the spectroscopic term symbol is D, just like the D state. The next thing we do is we sum all the M sub S's to get S. Well, here we have spin up, that's one half minus one half, so these cancel. And then you have four plus one halves, that gives us two. So S is equal to two. And then we put the multiplicity up here, that maximizes the multiplicity and gives us five, right? It's two S plus one, which is five. Now you'll notice that if I hadn't filled these this way, if I, if I don't put them all in in exactly this order, I could have three completely filled shells and two empty ones two completely filled values of M sub L and two empty ones. And then what I would get, I would get a very large value of L, but my multiplicity would be zero, or one rather, because these would add up to zero. So remember, the first Hund's rule is to maximize the multiplicity. So we, that's why we fill them all spin up and then the spin down. That maximizes the number of spin ups we have. Now, this 3D orbital is more than half full, right? There's only four empty states left out of 10. And so we use J is equal to L plus S. Well, L is equal to two, S is equal to two, J is equal to four, and our subscript is equal to four. So our final term symbol, symbol is D, 5D4. L equals two, S equals two, and J equals four. And this all comes easily out of this mnemonic graphical way of filling up the orbitals.
and we've now followed every Hund's rule. The only one we have to remember is the last one. Is it more than half full, in which case we add the spin and overlying momentum values? Notice these are not operators. These are the values L and S to get J. And if it's less than half full, we subtract them. Well, let's take a look at the chromium ground state. So the chromium has Z equals 24, and its orbital configuration is one less is uh, a little bit different because in this case you would think that it's 4s2 3d4 but in fact for a reason which you'll see in just a minute it's 4s1 3d5 and everything else is filled remember iron which is too bigger than this has 4s2 3d6 but in this case, we have two orbitals which are not filled, the 4s and the 3d. And you'll see exactly why this is a good thing. This is why it happens. Well, because you have the 4s, m is equal to 0, that's down below. Then you have m is plus 2, plus 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2. That's m sub l. I fill in with 1 and through 6 electrons. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And you see what this has done. This is why the configuration is not 4s2 3d4 because if you had 4s2 3d4 this electron would be paired and you would minimize you wouldn't maximize the spin and you wouldn't maximize the multiplicity so by having both these states partially filled you've maximized the multiplicity that's Hund's first rule well now we start counting we now want to count all the values of L. Well, this is zero. This is plus two. That cancels to minus two. Minus one cancels to the plus one, zero. L is equal to zero in this case. But S is equal to three because all the electrons have spin up. So S is equal to three. We have maximized our multiplicity. Unfortunately, L is going to be zero. So there's only one value of L we can have. We can't change L. J, because these are just half filled, we're going to use, remember if it's less than half filled, you use the difference. When it's half filled or more, you sum them. And so this gives L plus S equal 3. Well, it turns out when they're exactly half filled, it doesn't matter whether it's L plus S or L minus S, you would still get 3. So the term symbol in this case is a multiplicity of 7. L equals 0, which means it's an S state and j equals 3. Let's do one more example. We'll now look at the neodymium, which is a 4f, has a 4f electrons. It is a rare earth down at the bottom of the periodic table. And z is 60 in this case. And we have a bunch of filled shells all the way up to 4d10 and 5p6 and 6s2. What is empty is the 4f4. At 4f, it has four electrons in it. So now we have to lay out our, our uh, m sub l's. The f state is uh, l equals 3. So we start with plus 3 all the way to minus 3 up here. Those are seven of them. We have four electrons. We fill them up. We are less than half filled. We now calculate by summing the values of m sub l. We get 3 plus 2 plus 1, that's 6. So L is equal to 6, it is now maximized. S is equal to 2 because there's all four electrons are in the same direction. Because this is less than half filled, we have to sum J, L plus S is equal to J. Uh, pardon me, L minus S to take the difference. L minus S is equal to J, and this is 6 minus 2. Absolute value gives you 4. This is less than half filled. So the term symbol for this is L equals 6, which turns out it's I. Multiplicity is 5. 2s plus 1 is 5. And j is equal to 4. And so with this simple mnemonic, you can figure out what the ground state configuration will be. And in particular with the chromium, we could see that the ground state configuration was not the one with 4s2, uh, 3d4, but the configuration with 4s1 and 3d5.